Welcome to Communism Combat special interview with uh, Ms. Brinda Karat, CPIM Politburo member and former General Secretary of the All India Democratic Women's Association, a firebrand feminist and activist. So good morning Brinda, red salutes to you. <laughs> At you. this point, uh, we're talking about now August 2014, I just wanted to ask you for the younger people, for a whole lot of Indian voters, what according to you is the relevance of the left in India today? Last 14, 10 years if you look at it, the organized left was above 60, then under 30, now we are under 10 in parliament. So how would you explain the relevance of the left? Well, there are two things. One is, why is the left under 10 today? So that's a separate issue. And the relevance of the left. And I think if we stick to the question which you have raised about the relevance of the left, then I would say just within the last two months of the Modi Sarkar, we can understand the relevance of the left on three major issues. The first is livelihood issues, the issues of the workers, the issues of the working poor. And already, I mean, even before they get their breath, the government has started the attack. The whole issue of revising labor laws, which are now going to really open up uh, the labor market in a way to the extent of exploitation of workers which we which are going to be now you know uh, sanctioned by law the issue of contract workers the issue of deregulation of the workforce which in any case is a process which is happening so that is one area the second is if you look at some of the social sector areas and you look at Narega, for example, you look at the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. Now, I'm not saying that's a perfect scheme, but more, or even in the way it was implemented. But any government which comes to office with a promise of bringing something different to favor the poor, the first thing they do is to raise a debate as to whether Rega is, uh, is relevant, relevant or not. And they don't give the money for it. And then thirdly, and I think very, very importantly, if you just look at India and you look at the social composition of India and you have a government which says we've learned from the past and this is sabka saath, sabka vikas. And within two months, the triumphalism of the RSS and the Hindutva bodies, and you see the kind of communal polarization which is taking place not spontaneously but because of a Hindutva agenda planned and being implemented in state after state by the RSS and its uh, organizations, then you understand that where is it and who was it who fought relentlessly for the defense of the poor, for the defense of the rural poor, for the defense of social sector program and for the defense of secularism in this country. It was the left and therefore the relevance of the left as each month passes or each day passes, you, you see more and more the relevance of the left. Now if you could just explain that electorally what are we facing with, with this kind of neoliberal, uh, the, the entire shift of in Indian politics towards a neoliberal framework which didn't happen only with the BJP, it happened with the Congress and then you see an electoral also shrinking of space for the left. How will this fight back happen when elections today are market driven? You have huge amount of money being spent in terms of building up images, false or otherwise, in terms of uh, uh, whether it's your WhatsApp messages or your SMS messages, the entire campaign has become so Americanized and means huge money. So actually the planners and the movers behind elections are now not just the political parties but major corporate players. So in that, how will there be a fight back? I mean, I think that is the absolutely most relevant question um, which you have brought into this discussion because what we saw in these last elections, I mean, it was unprecedented. Of course, we've seen the use of money and it has happened in state after state and even at the center. So I'm not saying Congress ka dhula hua hai because they have done it, you know, they started it. But the fact of the matter is that what we see today is along with the rightward shift in politics, you have a much more direct role of corporates in the Indian political scene today in which the port, uh, uh, corporates are determining who's going to be in government. Now, whatever it was in the past, we didn't see this kind 
of a mobilization. And I think the utter failure of our system to prevent this, I mean, the American system is based on it. I mean, it's all open. You know, the corporate funding, the money they're spending, and the more money you spend, you know, so the better your state is. So what is. reforms do we need? Well, what, that yeah. is what I'm coming yeah, to. Yeah. So what I'm saying is the election commission, when it, when it looks at uh, the People's Representation Act, one very critical area here is expenditures. Now, the kind of money which was spent on the prime minister's, the now prime minister, prime ministerial campaign, like the presidential campaign in the States. And this was something to the tune of something like 5,000 crore rupees, which is not shown at all mm. in any of the election expenses. So one is that. And Secondly, no authority, neither election commission nor the courts are going to question this. Well, they don't question it, A, because it's convenient not to question it, because they can say, you know, the law doesn't prevent them from spending this kind of money right now. So that is apart from all the black money which came in. So that I'm not talking about. I'm just saying within the electoral framework today, there is a huge bias against those who do not have money, like the left. And therefore, that itself is one of the greatest disadvantages. I mean, for example, you look like a party like AAP is now saying that we're not going to fight elections because we don't have the, the money. money. <laughs> and yet, they had raised a substantial yeah. amount of money. But they're saying even that is not enough. So everybody knows that, look, money talks. But I, I think one electoral reform, yeah. two also, this first past the post system is also something mm. which does need to be reconsidered. And we have been of the opinion that we must have a proportional representation system in India where percentage of votes also matters. Yes. The BSP in UP gets 20% vote and, and no not seat. a single seat. We get 31% votes in West Bengal and just two seats. And the BJP at the centre gets 31% votes it's and two thirds of the seats. Yeah. So, you know, it's completely it illogical. It's, it's illogical. Now, when we speak about uh, coming back to left politics, which, 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 is, which is a certain way of looking at the economy, looking at the political economy, a certain analysis of the political economy, and the gender feminist perspective, which I think you, bo you embody both in one sense, your work as well, work at the grassroots and even the uh, book that you've written. Is there a tension? Is there a need to keep making forays within uh, left politics to assert the gender perspective? How difficult is it? There's no doubt that unless there's a constant assert, you see what happens, it's really also a period of, you know, compete, not just competing perspectives, because I think in the left, as far as gender is concerned, it's not so much as a competing perspective, mm. but certainly it is a question of the prioritization of issues. And what tends to happen or what has happened in the past with many of our programs and our perspectives and our work, that we have tended to look at uh, the gender aspect from an area where the party comes out in support mm. of this or that movement. Mm. Now that's fine as far as it goes because we do want to support women's groups and organizations in their efforts. But at the same time, the party itself has a very important role to play. And parties' political mobilization, what we have been arguing is that the political agenda has to expand, the political agenda has to shift, the political agenda has to change to make these priority issues. And I think that is where the assertion and has to And that's why come. EDWA grew from where it was to where it is now and is really one of the largest women's mass organizations probably in the world? Um, well. I, I think yes, except for the socialist countries, which Brazil, had very large maybe, yeah, uh, yeah, women's yeah, organizations. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps the rest of the world, yes, it is as far as membership based is concerned. So I think the South African uh, women's organization also has a very large membership. But the point that I would like to make here is that AIDVA's work is uh, very independent from the party's work. Okay. So we cannot at all say that AIDVA's membership at all reflects um, you know, the strength of the left. We can't say that. Because Edwa is working different sections of women on different issues and we have a much wider reach among so women. So the women in the left are more imaginative? 
Well, I won't say that because if you look at any of the mass organizations, you'll find that their membership goes far beyond the parties. Uh, that of the party. Because party has very strict rules about Post recruitment. Post May 2014, when you now have a complete and clear yeah. rightward shift, well. not just in uh, neoliberal economic terms, but e even in social, religious, political terms. Absolutely. Uh, is the position that the left is taking of being equidistant from the Congress and the BJP a wise one? Is it a repetition of a past mistake when it comes to the Bihar election? Well, I don't really think so because if you look at it, what has propelled the BJP into power? What has propelled the BJP into power is the utter failure of the Congress and the road of the BJP to power is littered with the uh, failures of the Congress party. And when I say failure, I don't really mean failure in the sense they set out a name and didn't achieve. What I mean is their perspective, which in very fundamental ways is the same as the BJP. Now, for example, what are you to think of a party which has come out openly in support of privatization of banks? When the Congress was in government, the BJP refused. Now, the BJP is in government, the Congress is very willing to play ball mm. because the corporates who have shifted to the BJP are telling the Congress, look, you know, if you want to, to get back no, into play. I, I fully am fully. So that entire. No, I'm fully with ambit. you on the economic uh, agenda, God, which was started true. in 91 by Narasimha Rao and Manmohan Singh when he was. I, no, but I'm still saying that there yeah. still appears to many of us to be a fundamental difference when it comes to the social religious political agenda. That's the communal agenda of the two. So, and, and this is not a battle, this is just understanding no, 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 that no. centrist space, the centrist space that the Congress once occupied and today has shrunk so... Well, it's not the job of the left to get the Congress to, to, to regain its center space. No, the job the of the left mm -hmm. is to shift Indian politics Towards to an alternative path. And if that alternative path means fighting what the Congress did in the name of secularism, I mean the Congress was in front, I know this, sir, that on every issue, even from 2004, when we were pushing the Congress to come out with strong legislations which would prevent a Gujarat, when we were pushing the Congress to take strong action, which it could within the constitutional framework, to ensure justice to those victims of Gujarat, what were the, the steps Congress on, didn't move. What were the steps on Gujarat that the Congress ought to have taken according to? Well, firstly, why should it have left the entire legal battle to brave individuals like yourself. What was the Congress doing in the Supreme Court? Why was the Congress not pushing those cases in the Supreme Court? Why had the Congress just given up that space? The Congress was in government. The Congress had a responsibility to intervene on that, on each and every case. You where the Supreme Court itself was saying that, you know, we're not sure that you're going to get justice in Gujarat. In such a situation, Congress sits back as a b benign observer. I mean, I won't say malignant, but certainly yeah. a benign observer. I mean, is that secularism? Mm. And is it secularism, for example, not to take into account very seriously the, uh, the recommendations of Ranganath Mishra Commission? Why? Because they were afraid of what the BJP was going to say. Mm. So, I'm sorry, I mean, Congress secularism is a, not a secularism which can be relied on. Among the Although I do see the difference between an RSS-backed government obviously. And, and a Congress. I mean, I certainly see the difference. Coming back to what other sorts of reform we need, yeah. what, you mentioned electoral reform in terms of proportional representation, electoral and reform money. in terms of money. In, in politics. What about judiciary and what about, you've talked a lot about gender budgeting, you've talked a lot about gender budgeting in terms of finance planning yeah. and the political economy. But I think Edwa has about 50,000 justice centers, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. where you take up cases yeah. uh, of women, whether it's domestic violence, uh, cup panchayats, dowry, etc. We find a huge hindrance in terms of genuine legal aid available yeah. for the poor, for women, for any disadvantaged section. Yeah. And I don't see the courts doing enough about yeah. gen generating really good legal aid. What sort of reform do we need in terms of the judicial system and the 
police system maybe when I mean quite frankly Tisa you're a person who has the most experience of the judiciary and uh, since you've got so many cases in court uh, you would know how frustrating the whole judicial system is and for us because working with Edward uh, for you know well since Edward was formed and, and and also you know looking at the way that other social movements also have faced such blockages and barriers one thing see apart from the independence of the judiciary which neither the collegium nor the uh, executive you know in fact both have been responsible That's for right. the present state equally, of affairs equally. but I think I, I sort of tend to agree that you know giving full power to the executive even in terms of numbers of the appointing committee you know that's really problematic so we do have a situation where we had suggested that there should be a balance between the two that's and right. there should also be some independent expert voices of people who you know ha are, who are reputed that's right. to have played a very important role in judicial reform so that's the sort of thing we're looking at but the other thing is the bias I mean the prejudice and the bias against in the judgments against women, against in many cases Dalits mm. and against Muslims, against minorities. How do you address bias in the judiciary? God, I tell you, I mean the I can't I, even speak I mean, about it. No, because if I do well, I, I, tell you, you, I mean I mean some of the things that we've had to do is just demonstrated courts, just make a public spectacle of it, just shame judge, judgments. The Banbari Devi judgment of the Rajasthan. I Rajasthana mean that Banbari Devi, and that was one. The other was the most terrible judgment of the Delhi High Court in which they said the dowry is an acceptable traditional practice of Hindu communities. Yeah. Yeah. We went, then we had contempt of court against yeah. us at yeah. that time and we had to fight the case. So there's so many cases like that. And the witnesses turning hostile, this whole oh, that issue. That is really... Uh, you know, I believe it's because the trials take so long that there's no time-bound end to the problem inside. That is absolutely critical. It's that a people time need bound. closure and the closure will only yes. come if there's a time-bound trial. No, and not only that, because there is no monitoring of that case. That by higher and judiciary. therefore what happens is, in a case which has very high stakes involved, in a case where powerful people are involved, in a case where politics rests on what happens in a particular case, there are going to be instances again and again where witnesses are pressured and also bought out. Should we not have the, CCTVs in the courtroom? You should have, yeah, but unfortunately... Not, I don't, I don't mean I media mean, cameras, I, don't I mean CCTVs just for the courts to record how judicial behaviour is happening. So in case there's a problem, the television I mean, cameras... I, think, I mean, that's an interesting suggestion. Frankly, I hadn't thought of CCTV. <laughs> Uh, in the court, but certainly I tell you, we're going to come to a situation in this country as far as so many cases are concerned, where forget the CCTV in the court, what is happening and where they're Outside. meeting witnesses and how they're buying out witnesses and how they're pressurizing witnesses, that's really, really a very... And one more thing I would just like to mention here is a number of innocent Muslims who have been thrown into jail in case after case without evidence. Whose failure is it? Who ke hai? Whose huh? failure is it? Well, one, it's a, undoubtedly it's the failure of politics. Because so, so everybody is responsible in that? No, no, of the ruling party. party Why yeah. everybody? Okay. Those who are doing it. The first thing, and then you don't control the police. You don't control your PROs of the police. The first thing they'll say is, and ministers, in those governments where this is happening and, and I'll include Maharashtra and include the UP central government at that time and BJP to hai hai. I mean before they've even reached the spot they're giving names of all kinds of people and all of them have to be minority community and that's why the Hindutva terror groups you know for so many cases yeah. they got away with it because yeah. you you were arresting the wrong people and people were saying yeah we want an arrest and therefore you give them an arrest and you also put your communal bias right there. How many women are there in the Central Committee and Politburo now? Well, Politburo is still only one. <laughs> and in the Central Committee, of course, it's increased. It's increased. So, that's, so your that's battle good. was well fought. 
I think it's everybody's battle. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brindan. Thank you very much.